That's true. There we go. That's the first mistake made this year. Look at this one. Well, hello, everyone. Glad y'all joined with us. All right. So we're there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. That's right after chapter 4. So we want to think about in this study, sin abounds, but grace much more abounds. Now, now is the time, now is the time not to be dull in our hearing or sluggish in our life because the Lord's standing at the door. But it's the time to have faith in God, to believe his faithfulness to his word and to lay hold on Christ and his promise of everlasting life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So are you there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5? We want to pick up reading in verse number 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. Boy, there's a lot of wickedness in the world today. I mean, it's just unbelievable. People who want to be God. But they're not. They talk about a one world government. Well, there's going to be a one world government. It's not going to be there. And we're not going to destroy the world. We can't. The Lord is. He's going to burn it up. So they need to get a lesson in prophecy. So he says here, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to keep company with fornicators. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with the adulterers, for then must you needs go out of the world. He's talking about that taking place in the church. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a raider or a drunkard or extortioner with such a one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do you not judge them that are within? But them that are without, <laughs> God judges. Therefore put away from you, from among yourselves, that wicked person. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread teaches us something. It teaches us that Christ has put away sin. So he said in verse 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. As ye are unleavened. Unsinned. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So the believer is to live their life as verse 8 exhorts us to. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So when you're born again, you're not a patched up person, but you're truly unleavened. So you owe your newness to Christ. So there is typology here. So look at verse 7. <clears throat> for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So there is a message for us today, and it's based on the understanding of the Passover. Leaven is a picture of sin. So the story is found in Exodus chapter 12. How many have read the story in Exodus chapter 12? That means you can raise your hand. Well, not many of you did, or either that you just filled and didn't, didn't <laughs> raise your hand. So if you haven't read that story, and I know you have, but it's good to go back and read that story again. Passover celebrates the salvation of the Israelites from their bondage in Egypt. Yahweh spared their lives because of the blood of the Lamb. Christ is our Passover, who is our Lamb, who is sacrificed for us, he has forgiven us of the penalty of sin by his death on the cross. 
He said, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And therefore, we, the believer, can keep the feast in maturity, but most operate in the flesh of malice and wickedness. But it is the mature and growing Christian who operates in sincerity and truth. The church body is made up of believers. And the body must, must call out the sins within the body. If not, the sin leavens the entire lump. We do not judge them that are without. We are to evangelize them. We're to win them to Christ. We're to preach the gospel. We're to take them the message of Christ. Now he says we are to judge ourselves. Second Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5 says, Examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Prove your own self. Know you not your own self how that Christ is in you except you be reprobates. Now that word reprobates is amazing there. It's the same adjective that Paul held up before himself as the dread, dreadful outcome he wanted to avoid where he said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Same word he's talking about, reprobate. Rejected, not approved. So go to with me to Hebrews chapter 13, verses one through nine. So there, here's something that's sweeping our country in the last days, and that's living together without marriage. The, the book of Hebrews says in this reference that we'll read in a minute that marriage is what honorable. So, you know, this came home to me recently and. uh, I had this wonderful couple that called me one day, the, the, the guy did. He had a connection with our church. Um, his great aunt was, was my treasure uh, in the church because she had COVID this past year and in the fall and she died. And uh, he asked me if I would marry him and his fiance and so I told him I would, uh, but I needed to talk with him first, and then actually we would decide from that. And uh, so they, they came, and uh, and we met and talked. And so I asked them in, in the time, I said, y'all been living together for a long time. And I said, uh, why did y'all decide to get married now? And uh, they said, well, Back when all that began, we were strung out on drugs and we didn't really know what we were doing. And, um, and then they said that one day they decided that wasn't no way to live. So they got off on drugs. Amen. And had been off on for a while. And they said, we got to thinking that it wasn't right to live together and not be married. And so there was four children involved. And, and one of them by, was by there together. Neither one of them had been married before. And uh, so I thought, man, you know, that's, that's something. I, I have to commend them for what they did in their decision. And so I told them I would. And, but I said, we, we have to talk and meet together. You know, and so we did. I, I had about six weeks, met every Friday. And um, I gave them things to do, and and they did them. They did every one of them. And uh, in that, I, I said, I want you to write down and tell me why you think you're going to heaven. And they did. And, and, and the, the lady, especially, had shed a she had a, a clear, concise statement of, of being saved. And uh, so they got married this past Saturday. Hey. And I remember standing there looking at them. 
And I said, I have to commend y'all for what you did. Amen. And uh, it, it, to me, it was just, I could see what the Lord was doing in their life but without me being involved in it. He's the one that did all that. And, and, and uh, but it was, it was amazing to me how they, how they did that. And so on Friday night, and you know, I'm not much of a, a director for a wedding, you know, but I was trying to help them. And, and uh, I did what I could. And so her mother was there and her stepmother was there and her daddy was there and her mother was was in a, a home trying to get free from drugs. But one of the things that she asked was she liked to get some information and know more about the life. And then her dad spoke up on Friday night, just off the cuff, right in front of everyone. And he said, the preacher said, all these need to get saved and baptized. And she turned around to him and she said, I have been saved. And I thought, man, that's good. Amen. And so we're having dedication day this coming Sunday, May the 7th, it is. And I had told them at the end of their time, or right before the last time we met together, that since they were married, we're going to be married by that Saturday that I'd like for them to come dedicate their children to the Lord. And she said, we'll do that. He said, we'll do that. That's what we're doing. And she said, I'd like to be baptized too. Oh. So it's amazing what the Lord does, isn't it? Amen. Yes. Isn't he wonderful? Yeah. Anyway, I commend them for what they did. And that's something that's just, you hear more and more about it now. But the Bible says, remember this, the Bible says that marriage is honorable. Are you there in Hebrews chapter 13? He said, let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them and them which suffer adversity. Now, now think of this. And bound with them which suffer adversity. Don't go off and leave them. That's when they need our help. Amen. As being as being yourselves also in the body. <laughs> you know, probably you need to really get used to each other because that's your body, the church here. That's who you're probably going to be close to in them. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. And then he says this, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Now, he says here, let's continue on in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. He says, anyone that's named a brother, well, there's no surprise if one's not named a brother, how they live. But it is surprising for someone who names the name of Christ. So we see that he has continued on in this. We saw in the last hour, he's speaking to believers. There are Bible doctrines that we must be aware of. And what is a Bible doctrine? Of course, you know, it's what the Bible has to say about any subject. Right. And there are major subjects taught in the Bible that we are to be aware of, and that is sin, its origination and how it entered the world and what that means to the human race. Yes. Amen. And then salvation, that's what we need to know about. That's a Bible doctrine. That's God's provision for mankind and how a person is born again. A lot of confusion in the world today about that. And then there's prophecy. The rapture of the church, the resurrection, the judgment seat of Christ, the tribulation, the second coming of Christ to the earth, the great white throne judgment, the new heaven, the new earth, and then eternity. 
We're living about 2,000 years after the cross. We're living in the end time prior to the rapture. The rapture means the end of the church age. Right. So we're living in the time prior to the rapture, and it is marked by falling away from the word of God. And I know, and I believe in, in, in 2 Thessalonians, he's talking about that falling away. He's talking about the rapture of the church there. But there is a falling away from the word of God. And it's marked in this age in which we're living. See, the professing church would say, oh, no, we're not falling away. But this age is marked by gross misunderstanding of the word, the indifference to the word, and obedience to the word. And that's laid out for us. And I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 5. This is laid out for us in Hebrews chapter 5 all the way through chapter 6. Very interesting, very encouraging portion of Scripture, really. And the way it ends up in chapter 6, it is most powerful. So uh, I want to begin reading in verse, uh, well, let me back up and just read chapter 5 and, and, and start reading in verse 11. And it says, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you're dull of hearing. Now, when you look up that word dull of hearing, it has a meaning of acting stupidly. He said, dull of hearing. But for when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles or the oracles of God, and become as such as have need of milk, not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them to full age, and those who by reason of use have their senses exercised, they're in both good and evil. And then I want you to come down to we're going to go all through, we're going to go through the entire chapter of chapter six, but I want you to come down to verse four. And four through six is the verses that cause so much misunderstanding today. It says here, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God in the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away to renew them again at repentance, seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God, the fresh and put him in open chain. So there's a couple of things that we need to know. First of all, consider this. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. So enlightened, tasted, made partakers are eternal events. Yep. The word tasted is to experience. It's the same word that's used in Hebrews 2, 9, where it says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Jesus did not sip of death. He experienced death for every person. Amen. His death was counted for every person. The agony of his death is described in all of the Gospels. In that period of time, he experienced death. He cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That means that he died alone for our sins that he carried in his own body. He experienced death. He didn't just sip of death. Second, we need to consider the example that's referenced here, and that's in Numbers chapter 14. So I want you to go to Numbers chapter 14, if you would, please. Now, a, a close reading of Numbers chapter 14 will reveal the fact that God originally wanted to disinherit all the Israelites except for Moses and start over with them to make a great nation. But Moses pleaded for him not to do this. Thus God obliged Moses, but still would not change his mind as it related to the first generation entering the land. 
So the Exodus generation decided there at Kadesh Barnea the next day after they learned of the uh, of God's decision in spite of it, they changed their mind about going in. They originally said that they believed the, the lie of the, of the, of the, the spies that, that brought back the evil report. So they wasn't going to go in. They wanted to go back to Egypt. They were going to appoint somebody to take them back to Egypt. So they changed their mind after they heard the judgment, but God did not change his mind. They suffered defeat when they attempted to enter. They said, we'll go on. He said, don't go on. I won't be with you. But they went. So the lesson of Numbers 14 is brought out in the third morning reveal. God is jealous about sharing his glory to whom he shows great and mighty works and his glory ought to be heeded. So we all take a lesson. So we ought to keep in mind that all the things that happen should be viewed through the lens of how it applies to us today and where the world is today. Thus, the repentance spoken of in Hebrews 6, 6, it's on God's part, not on the individual's part. Amen. Right. So look in, look in Hebrews, uh, excuse me, Numbers chapter 14. I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but let's read verses 17 through 24. And I want to emphasize verses 20 and 23. Okay. So he says, and the Lord said, Verse 20, and the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word, but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all these men who have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, have tempted me these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. We ought to listen. The children of Israel repented after they heard that judgment and said, we'll go. But they never got to go. Right. There will be, are you listening? There is no doubt there will be multitudes, people living today who will realize they missed the rapture and will turn to the Lord in the tribulation and will die for their faith in Christ. Revelation 24 says, And I saw thrones, and they set upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. That's part of the first resurrection. Found in Revelation chapter 20. Verses 5 through 6. And then I want you to think about the judgment of the nations, the Gentiles. There will be Gentiles who make it through the tribulation as given in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. So our giving of the good news of Christ is an eternal message. Are you listening? It's an eternal message for today and through the tribulation. Come on, what do I mean by that? Well, listen, the word sown in the hearts can bring forth deliverance. Even if they miss the rapture in the tribulation, if they know the truth, we better give the truth. Amen. And not only that, we ought to be leaving, leaving something for them to know what to do if they miss the, the rapture and they live in the tribulation because there's going to be people with great fear and trembling because they have heard the truth, but they didn't believe the truth. Yeah. And so they need to know what to do. You know, there was a lady in our church that fixed up thumb drives and put on uh, what, what she called a rapture kit and left. I, I know people that's left food and had a like a food bank and left gospel tracts and, and messages about the tribulation for people who would come to their home. I mean, people's going to come to your home. 
you know, you're gone and, and maybe all your family's gone, but you know, they're going to come to your house and go through it. Okay. And they're going to, they want to take what's yours. They're going to try to take it before then. You know, you see all the stuff that's been passed and, and what's been crammed down our throats and, they tell us, uh, you know, uh, that the borders are secure and we know not, we know they're not, but they tell us we don't really know what's going on. We know more what's going on than they know. So we need to we need to be given the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, number three, the promised land is not a picture of heaven. It's not a picture of heaven. It is synonymous with the victorious life of the believer, which will be rewarded at the judgment seat of the Christ, or the believer will suffer loss. So you read that. How many know where you read that about suffering loss? Anyone? Anyone else? Anyone else? I, I'm not, there, there's a good answer. There's another one that I think is a little better. First Corinthians chapter three, turn in your Bibles. First Corinthians chapter three. So, and then, and, and something we need to be my, mindful of. So, are you there? Amen. So let's look at verses 13 through 15. So here's what he said. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. But if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet shall live. Talking to the believer at the judgment seat of Christ. So, the strong language. Now, go with me back to Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 8. Say amen when you're there. Amen. Say a one if you want to wait. <laughs> are, you, are you back to? I want you to see this. Oh, Hebrews chapter 6 verse 8 so many expositors conclude the individual described here as an unbeliever but it's not but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing it has almost the same meaning that rejected as Hebrews 5 11 when he's talking about Dull. Mm. Okay, now that language has been interpreted as referring to eternal punishment in the lake of fire. It should be noted that God does intend to judge his people at the judgment seat of Christ, which is why we looked at 1 Corinthians 3 13 through 15. So we should acknowledge that. But we need to also follow this, that the Bible nowhere teaches that a person can be saved and lost. Come on, yes, amen. The Bible teaches eternal salvation. If you think that you can lose your salvation, you don't really understand how to be saved or what salvation is. Right. So you're born into the family of God. You can't be unborn. It, it's something that, that can never be lost or taken away from you. It, it's eternal. You have a home in heaven. You're his child. More than that, he indwells you and he seals you by the Holy Spirit of God. You belong to him. Now, so the Bible never teaches you can be born again and then lost. Okay, also, look there in verse 7 and 8 and follow with me. Verse 7 and 8 does not teach two different grounds but only one ground with two different outcomes. Right. Yes. And so that would be your life, you, your heart. You are, you are to go on to maturity and be fruitful. As he said in chapter five, verses 11 through 14. Now the word rejected in verse eight, okay, 
means worthless. I mentioned this earlier about the word reprobate in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. It's the same word Paul used to describe himself in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, where he said, I myself should be a castaway. Same word, rejected, castaway, reprobate. It means rejected, castaway. So we are to bear fruit not forms by going on to maturity. Amen. So listen to what he said, and I know y'all know this verse because if you ever got an email from your pastor, you saw this verse. First Corinthians, uh, excuse me, Colossians chapter one, verse 27, 28. To whom God would make known those the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man mature growing in Christ. So the word warning is a harsh word to us in the English, but it's not in the Greek. It is used because of the consequences of not heeding the admonition. In other words, it shows great compassion that Paul had for everyone. He said later, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So any pastor that's worth his salt is jealous over his congregation that they would be robbed of the riches that they have in Christ and the knowledge of him. So he wants to stand and fight for them. Now, so the word whom we preach, the word warn means to put in mind, admonish, to reprove gently. It means to warn like you're going down the road. And you know, I've been on some roads I hadn't been on before and it's fog and it's raining and you're going around the curb and I always thought, well, I hope the bridge is not out. That's what he's telling you. That's what the word warn means. The bridge is out. The road is closed. Take another route. That's not hard words, harsh words. That's just words to avoid a disaster. Nice. Colossians 4.12 says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of God, salutes you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. That's talking about being mature and growing in Christ. Yes. Ephesians 4.13 says, till we all come, in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect man as to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And then he says in verse 14 that, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sly of men, cunning, crap. You, you wouldn't think that people would do. But did you know that Satan presents himself as an angel of light? Right. And he has ministers who transform themselves into angels. Right. Right. So there are, you know, I listened to a message the other day, and a man, you, you would have thought she was listening to a, a, a sermon back in the 1950s. You said, well, what's wrong with that? There's a lot of things wrong with that. Listen, there's a lot of things happened since then that have moved us down the line in the, in the, in the form of prophecy. Yep. And, you know, that's the capstone of, of, of what we believe is, is prophet, the spirit of Christ is prophecy. Listen, the rapture is coming. It's here. It should have been talked about in the 1950s, but it wasn't. Do I get an amen? Oh my goodness, what a savior we have. Amen. Listen, he says, growth and maturity is expected in the life of a believer. Look in Hebrews 6, 9. But beloved, we are expected better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end that you be not slothful. Guess what? Slothful. And dull at the same moment. 
mean the same thing. It means sluggish, lazy, and stupidly, acting stupidly. What are the things that accompany salvation? Well, know that you're saved. Uh, go to First John chapter one. First John chapter one. See the assurance of salvation is probably the essence of saving faith. Do you understand what I said? Yeah. All right. Are you there in uh, in First John? Yeah. So I want to read verses one through three. He said, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon in our hands of him or of the life, for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you that you may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father. And with his son, Jesus Christ. Oh, what a savior that we have. Now, salvation is not obtained by trying to emulate the things that accompany salvation. That makes salvation by works. Things that accompany salvation are produced by the Holy Spirit who indwells and seals the believer like we have in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 through 14, if you'd like to turn. So he says here, well, one other verse I want to read before we get there. I want to go back and go over to 1 John chapter 5, verse number 10. It says in that verse, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave him. Son, if a man was right, he would have said, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself, and he that believeth not God does not have the witness in himself. That's not what God said. He said, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself, he that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believed not the record that God gave him his son. That, that, that has a, a most powerful meaning if you stop and meditate on it. So let, now let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter one. And I'll be there in a minute. I get these pages won't cooperate with me. And uh, so, so are you there in in Ephesians chapter 1. Well, I'm not. So here I am now. So, so here we are. Okay. So I want to look at that from Ephesians chapter 1. And, and, and go through and analyze what he's seen. So in verse 11, he says, in whom? You see that in whom? In Jesus. Also, we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who worked all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also, after that you believe the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believe you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the same word as whom now think of that in whom also after that you believe you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which that word which is the same word as whom is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory Salvation is by believing on Jesus for eternal life. Listen to Jesus' own words. Listen to the greatest sermon ever preached. 
I call it the greatest sermon ever preached by Jesus himself when he preached to Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. Listen to what he said here in verse 15, chapter 3, verse 15, John chapter 3, verse 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Mm -hmm. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He made you savable at the cross. He took your sin in his own body. He took away the sin barrier. He made salvation free for you to believe. And he made this promise to all who believe. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this. And then again, 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you believe on the name of the Son of God. So now's not the time to be dull and slothful and sluggish, be slack. Now's not the time to be discouraged, deceived. But followers of them who through, who through faith and patience Inherit the promises. Followers, imitators. That's what that word follow means. But followers of them, that word followers means imitators. You're supposed to imitate those who have followed Christ. Amen. You get dull by turning away from the word of God. So don't be discouraged or deceived or devoid of the faithfulness of God by unbelief and imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And so, and who does the writer? Now look at this. Look, 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 look down in chapter 6 and at, at, at verse 13. So we, we got, we, we just went through verse 12, Hebrews 6, 12. But followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Followers means imitators. Imitate someone. Though I want you to look now who the writer uses for you to follow. Are you there? No. Hebrews 6. Okay. Yeah. All right. Look who he uses as an example for you to follow. Abraham. 13 through 15. He says Abraham in 13 through 15. Let me get over there. Okay. Uh, I'll be there in a second. Just hold on. So he 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 he, uh, he uses Abraham as the example in thirteen through fifteen. He said, "But when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself." So he looked around and he found no one that was as great as him, and there's no one greater than him. So he just put himself under. Not that he had to. But he did this so he gave you a landmark that you can wrap your brain around and my brain around. He couldn't find anyone greater, so he just swore by himself. Saying, surely blessings I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. So after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Okay. So he used Abraham as an example. Then he used the character of God, verses 16 through 18. He said, for men barely swear by the greater and oath of confirmation is to them an end of all strife. So what was the two immutable things? Well, it was his word and his oath. When God willing more abundantly to show the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by no. That's the character of God. And then what else did he use? He put before you to lay hold on Christ. Nineteen through twenty, he said, "Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, yes, Lord. both sure and steadfast, and that which entereth into that within the veil." Jesus is inside the veil. Oh my goodness! You know, I heard. Bernie McRae, he was a chalk artist. And, and so he, he drew this picture of this ship going into the, the harbor. And so, the, and he used this verse and he says, you know, there in 
verse 20, you see that word forerunner? So what a forerunner was, they, they took the anchor and they put them in these little boats and they took that anchor and boats and they took it in the harbor. In the harbor. The little boat was a forerunner. And so that that rope was attached to a winch on that big ship. And so the secret was you had to keep the rope tight. So Christ is the anchor. He's the rope. He's everything. And so they they just kept drawing that big ship in. They had to keep the rope rope tight because it was shipwrecked if it got to the side. Right. So Jesus is ever listen. Jesus is in the veil. You know what? You can go there too because your Savior is there. And so he gave us those examples there. And I just love the way he said, be an imitator, follower. And he gave those examples of Abraham, the character of God. And then he said, lay hold on Christ. Yes. Lay hold on Christ. Yeah. You ought to believe Christ about everything. Yes. You ought to believe him. Listen, he would not lie. He cannot lie. Right. He's truthful. Right. He said, if you believe in God, believe also in me. I am God. Yes. And he said, you have looked at me and said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father." Oh, what a Savior. Now, I want to wrap it up by going back to 1 John chapter 1. So if you follow me there, please, I appreciate it. So there we are in 1 John chapter 1, verse number 9. How is a Christian forgiven of their sin? By confessing that sin, whatever it is to Jesus. That's how you forgive. That's how a Christian is forgiven. Now listen. So we're there in 1 John 1, 9. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. If any man sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And then he said, in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath yes. everlasting life. Not will have it. You have it now. And just keep in mind, he's not talking about two different grounds nope. in that. He's talking about one ground. But it can bring forth fruit, or uh, thorns or fruit. And it's up to us. We need to go on with Christ and follow him. We have, He made a way for us to do everything through him to live victoriously. So lay hold on Christ. He entered that within the veil. And you can go there too. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Love y'all. Thank you so much for your attention. Praise God. Amen. Yeah. Amen and amen. Aren't you glad that you're here today? Amen. And I tell you what, just look around real quick. It's pretty good attendance for a Saturday. You know what? We got some people that weren't here today. We'll we'll harass them tomorrow. For all of those also online here, it is great to see you. A young lady, I'm assuming from Pakistan, yes. that um, that uh, we're seeing here, uh, Visa, Visa, something. Anyway, it's good to see you as well as all the others yeah. uh, that are here present. Pisa, okay, wonderful. Good to hear your voice, too. Welcome. Glad you're here. We're glad all of you are here today. And let's, uh, let's stand. Sanctuary, right? Come on up, everybody. Everybody knows sanctuary. I'm not going to go back to my PowerPoint. Let's stand as we sing. We'll get ready to be dismissed. <laughs>
Thank you, Reva. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. I commend you now to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Set your mind on things above and not on the things of this earth, for you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and peace be with you. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for this time around your word. Thank you for the, the dedicated learning and experience and training that Pastor Roger has put in for years and years to be able to stand up to help share with us the word of God, to help explain the word of God, to be a, a, a solid teacher for us as well as all of those who are listening online all who will be listening on youtube and rumble but also for the, those he serves in his own church father we thank you may you bless him bless Rod, uh, uh, margie and just help them continue to have the health and strength that they need uh to complete the journey and even so come lord jesus we pray for it's in his name that we pray today amen and amen. Remember now tomorrow that